Hey, thanks everybody for uh, joining us at uh, 525 on, uh, on uh, Thursday. I guess it's good to see you're still awake. Um, we've got a pretty uh, exciting session for you today. You can read the title here. Um, we'll introduce ourselves in a second, but uh, we just wanted to start out with a few questions. Hopefully we can click it to it. That way. Maybe we have a, there. I, uh, ah, I, I, have a, I have my new manual <laughs> clicker. <laughs> um, how many people here, hopefully you're here for this, are running databases on Kubernetes today? Awesome. And then on the next one, of course, if you'll be interested, how many of you are actually running Postgres on Kubernetes today? I guess that's why you're here, because that's what this talk is about. Um, all right, so what are we going to sort of cover today? Uh, there's a couple of interesting ways of deploying Postgres. Um, so we want to talk about how do we actually scale Postgres and some of the cool things we do in Kubernetes. So how can I deal with like a single primary deployment? How do I scale that? Right? Many people may think just add more replicas. Um, so that's going to be the key thing. And then the second part we're going to talk about is just in general, how do we scale these sort of databases? Now, who are we? Uh, my name's uh, Gary Singh. I, uh, I don't describe myself very much because I'm very secretive. So I'm just a product manager at Google, and I'm going to pass it over to Gabriella, who is much cooler than me. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Let's see if this works. I don't think, yeah, it doesn't work. So I need to stay oh. here. Yeah, oh, that's okay. Oh, that's yeah. nice. I'll stay here. That's okay. So uh, I'm Gabriele Bartolini. I'm uh, vice president of ED, uh, Cloud Native and Kubernetes at EDB. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, this is kind of a dream for me. You know, I've been using Postgres for many, many years, uh, since uh, early 2000. I'm a Postgres contributor. I'm also a data on Kubernetes ambassador. And uh, DevOps is actually what led me to Kubernetes. And my first KubeCon was in 2019. And that was with Marco, who's here uh, with me. He's one of the maintainers. And we started to think about this operator for Postgres using local storage, you know, like we had it been done for many years outside Kubernetes, and people thought we were crazy. So I'm really happy to be here today, you know, after this journey. That's when Cloud Native PG basically was born. Uh, that was August 20, 2019. So, and I'm a proud co-founder and maintainer of Cloud Native PG. And previously, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Postgres. How many of you need, uh, know Barman? Okay, I'm the one that came, with the, uh, came up with the name, and, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, again, with uh, Marco, I'm one of the uh, creators of this project. And we put basically all the experience we did with Barman, we've put it in Cloud Native PG, as well as the, the experience we, we gained with Rep Manager, of which I was one of the early developers. That's what we put inside. So the agenda for today is uh, we'll introduce vertical scalability with Postgres first, and then how to manage Postgres in Kubernetes with Cloud Native PG, and then show some techniques to vertically scale Postgres through storage. Uh, then with, with Gary, we'll show some benchmark results, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, finish with the takeaways. So Postgres has recently uh, received significant recognition, and it's been named Database of the Year by DB Engines. And it's also holding the top spot as the most popular database management system, according to Stack Overflow's uh, latest survey. In my opinion, a key factor for this you know, Postgres success is uh, a foundational feature that Postgres has had from day one, extensibility. So uh, with extensibility, we can basically tailor our database using uh, data types that we create or, or functions that use these data types. So basically, what I've seen in you know, real life uh, over the years is that Postgres has continuously, continuously evolved, and it's learned from all the technologies from different domains that were, were rising throughout you know, these two, three decades. And, and the, the constant has been SQL. So I've seen, for example, XML coming up, JSON. You can actually mix structured data and structured data in Postgres. And extensions like PostGIS, Timescale, and the latest addition, PG Vector, that uh, keeps Postgres at the forefront of innovation. 
So given the increasing demand for AI and analytics workloads, our focus today, I had to put AI, sorry. Okay, our focus today is to offer insights on uh, how to enhance Postgres databases um, to cover these critical use cases. Okay, so the idea for us today is to bring as much data as we can to, to um, uh, AI workloads and analytics. So let's start with uh, vertical scalability in the context of Postgres. So imagine this scenario. You, you are managing a Kubernetes node. Uh, it could be virtual, uh, virtual machine or physical, doesn't matter. This node uh, comes equipped with uh, uh, its own set of resources, CPU, RAM, and most importantly, uh, storage. Storage is the most critical uh, component for a database. And I'm also talking about directly attached storage. Don't think that in Kubernetes, you know, storage is, needs to be shared. You can run bare metal uh, with locally attached disk. You can do everything. It's pure freedom. So our objective here is to fully maximize the potential of this single node within a database uh, framework, and if necessarily, uh, uh, upscale the resources. So uh, this concept in database uh, technology, and also I mean computer, uh, computer sciences, is known as vertical scalability. However, when we think about Kubernetes, the prevailing notion suggests that scaling a database uh, across uh, multiple nodes is actually simpler. But that means coming to compromises, compromises in terms of consistency, availability of performance, for example. But do we really need that? So this is, this is kind of the question. And this approach is uh, referred to as horizontal scalability. Um, so in, in, in any case, today we focus on vertical scalability. And uh, you can scale vertically uh, using all the resources of, of a single node, CPU, RAM, but today we'll focus on storage. So before we delve into uh, the, the specific, I want to quickly recap what Cloud Native PG uh, does and some, you know, a, a reference architecture for running Postgres in Kubernetes. If you want to know more, there's a QR code there. You can scan it and you can get redirected to a blog article that I wrote uh, in the CNCF blog about the recommended architectures for Postgres in, in Kubernetes. So today we'll mention this um, architecture for a single cluster. So, you, I mean, we're talking about a three availability zone or plus uh, Kubernetes cluster. So it means that your single point of failure with just this setup is a region, which is huge for a database. And Kubernetes simplifies all the business continuity uh, plans for you, okay, thanks to this uh, self-filling and high availability approach. And uh, th what I'm gonna show you is, um, is, is, is provides very uh, high results in terms of a recovery time objective and recovery uh, point of the, uh, objective, RTO and RTO. So we have three availability zones with one worker node dedicated for Postgres in each availability zone. So we position the primary for Postgres in a one worker node, and it comes with its PGDASA persistent volume. PGDASA is where, by default, all Postgres files are located. And if we want to, we can add another volume to separate transactional logs uh, in another volume, and then also use table spaces, which are a way to, and we'll see it, to, to, to uh, um, add more, more, more space for Postgres. We can use uh, native streaming replication for Postgres with synchronous, standby, synchronous replication. So you have a synchronous standby and a potentially synchronous one. Then we provide a read-write service and a read-only service to access the standbys. So this is by default the architecture you get out of a very basic uh, cluster in, uh, in uh, Cloud Native PG. In any case, today we will focus on, on this. So what we'll try to do is that uh, we're, we're trying to adopt a scientific approach here today. And uh, you have to understand that your organization is unique. 
So you have your unique people, your unique uh, uh, systems, your unique data. And the idea is that uh, you can only choose through a scientific, scientific approach and uh, let your, basically let data drive, drive your decisions. So the idea here is to benchmark, benchmark, and benchmark not only the database, but the storage. So at the end, we will provide um, some results. So now it's your turn, Gary. Back, back to me. Um, yeah, so now let's talk a little bit about how many people here are familiar with Cloud Native PG? Man, this is a good, this is a good audience. All right, well, cool. You got the next one? Oh, yeah. So just for those who may not be, um, Cloud Native PG, it's a level five production-ready Kubernetes operator, uh, which is fantastic. Um, it's already in use in a number of places, obviously from EDB's Big Animal uh, at IBM's Cloud Pack. We have a, in a Google Marketplace, Tembo. Uh, you, can read, you can read all the chart, but you know, fully open source, Vendral neutral, uh, created by EDB. It's great um, uh, for working on that. Multiple deployment options, straight from a manifest for those who love to use whatever your GitOps tool might be. Is this working again? We'll see. We'll try. Yeah. We'll try again. And, uh, you know, as well as uh, OLM from, uh, from Operator Hub. And uh, you already saw the kind of the results on this. Um, super popularity in 2023. How many stars do we have? 3,000 stars on this already. So um, this is great. You can check out the, uh, the link there down at the bottom if you want to capture that. It's not working. Okay. Not working. We tried. The, uh, the really nice thing um, being the fact that I am a... Uh, Love Kubernetes, right? This is like the simplest version of the cluster resource. Um, I'm sure you've all seen Kubernetes manifest, but um, this is super simple to get, you know, up and running, right? I mean, how many people have seen, you know, tried to do stateful set stuff themselves and configure everything themselves? Um, and then obviously we can move to the sort of an operator model. Um, this is pretty nice, right? We basically just say, I want a cluster, I want to name it. How many replicas do I want? And storage. Obviously, we'll talk about some more configuration parameters, um, but that's you know, about as easy as it gets right, to get up and running. Uh, on the next chart, I guess we'll have to move that over. Um, I guess let me ask this question. How many people are, if I had a beard, I would be a gray beard. That's why I shave it. Um, how many folks actually used to work with database in the days before we had Kubernetes and VMs? Yeah. Do you guys remember creating, you know, RAID disk arrays, mounting raw volumes, trying to figure out how to map everything for optimal rights and everything like that? And that's a lot what you might see from your DBAs. So how do we make that easier? You know, Gabriella said we can do, we can mount whatever we want on Kubernetes nodes, right? Um, but can we make it much easier for you, right? So obviously, I'm sure everybody's familiar with dynamic provisioning. Um, you know, this is great. Um, with storage classes, we can have separate volumes, right? Um, and with this operator, we're actually doing direct management of the storage itself, not having to deal in the instances themselves, not having to deal necessarily with the stateful sets. Obviously, there's going to be some mandatory volume that must be created. Um, and you'll see when we get to some of the performance testing, just like you used to you know, have to optimize for where, where you want your logs written, where you want you know, different uh, storage spaces, um, you can do this for the write-ahead logs, as Gabriella mentioned. Um, and you can, of course, divide things up into numbers of table spaces. Uh, the beauty of this is, too, obviously, under the covers, we're leveraging all the, you know, I guess you'd call it, I call it Kubernetes magic. Um, but again, you can more easily configure this without having to do it yourself through just a manifest definition from the, from, through the operator manifest here, um, as we cover there. I think the other main thing to, to look at is, you know, learn a little bit. The only thing you have to know is a little bit about what your CSI provider does and what your actual storage you know, your backing storage is, right? Is it an SSD? Is it fast? Whatever, whatever it may be, you're going to have to use those characteristics, and you'll see that that's why, why testing becomes important on those, because you may need to look, you know, trade-offs between performance, cost, and efficiency. Um, and, of course, we have the, uh, some of the great work that's been done, I think, in Kubernetes lately, volume snapshots. You get a lot of stuff for, I'll call it for free, um, yeah. that, that's sort of in there, which makes it easy, right? Because now we're just using native Kubernetes volumes, and we can just use snapshotting capabilities. And, and then there's obviously, there's other backup and recovery technologies as well that work in there, uh, that makes it yeah. super simple. Yeah, that's actually a very good point, Gary. It's about leveraging what Kubernetes already provides. This is kind of one of the pillars of, of Cloud PG. So thanks for... Yeah, I think the, um, I mean, we, we've seen, you know, I think just we won't go too much into it, but there's many times where people try to figure out how to, how do you map, I guess, you know, normal constructs to Kubernetes constructs, right? I think Kubernetes has evolved enough to actually support these workloads, and we have that sort of great mapping. 
Um, and before Gabriella goes into uh, some details on these things, we thought we'd just introduce some concepts in case some of you weren't familiar with them. Uh, the concept of table spaces, right? These are sort of these global objects that you can have in Postgres. Um, they're typically going to be used to how you might want to divide up volumes. Typically, like on the, on the simplest version, they'll map to either, you know, a directory or it could be an actual, you know, raw disk or whatever, you know, on there. Um, the typical use cases for these obviously store temporary files, divide up uh, logs, do things for separate disks. And as we said, because basically dynamic provision class, uh, storage provider classes, right, are typically going to create another dedicated disk in Kubernetes. Hopefully that's the way you set things up, you know, on-prem in the cloud. That's typically how it works. You create a new storage volume. Um, it's typically going to map to whatever, a new solid state disk or persistent disk or whatever it may be, but those are going to be dedicated to you with multiple things mounted to your actual underlying nodes. Um, and this is beautiful, um, and we'll talk about how to configure this uh, pretty simply with just the table spaces stanza, right? You just add as many of those as you want, and I think you're next. Yeah, so thanks, Gary. So now we'll start exploring some techniques. So if you've been using Postgres outside Kubernetes, this is all stuff you know. This is stuff we've been doing for many, many years. And I love the fact that now we can, there's a new wave of, of us explaining this stuff. You know? So uh, this section, by the way, is the cornerstone of, of, of this pre pre presentation. So in the previous slide, uh, Gary so, uh, told you about how Cloud Native PG um, offers a sim seamless approach to scaling at the storage level. So we can create additional volumes for walls and also table spaces. So you've got flexibility here. You can customize storage classes and also optimize cost efficiency and IO bandwidth uh, uh, for specific volume purposes. So also the fact that Kubernetes is working through annotations to control bandwidth uh, and, and uh, uh, optimi optimize uh, the specific uh, volumes is great because for us it's just adding one, one annotation in, in the configuration. So volumes can be added to uh, live clusters, and they can also be resized if the storage class supports it. And uh, this, this basically gives us uh, tremendous adaptability in, in, and scalability in, in case you know, we, need, we need to grow. So um, just to recap, the primary advantages of scaling with volumes, it's not just performance isolation, but also predictability of performance. This is very important to know uh, what's, what you can expect from, from, from your uh, storage. And also distribute uh, uh, queries across multiple volumes. And uh, also simplify and make more, more efficient op database operations like vacuum or indexing or re-indexing. So in, in, the, the, the lo lovely way of doing this in Cloud Native PG is that you just need to add two lines. And basically, here we say to, to, to Cloud Native PG, create a new volume for walls and using the default storage class. And here is how you add basically a temporary table space. So a temporary table space called TMPTBS. And uh, basically, we are telling uh, Postgres to add this uh, volume, this, this table space, in the temp table spaces uh, uh, configuration option of, of Postgres. So the, the operator does that transparently. For, for you, you can add more. So it's really interesting. And uh, a widely used technique, uh, uh, which is particularly effective if your database is simple, is uh, to involve separating I.O. for uh, operations for tables and indexes. So in this uh, very simple example, we create two table spaces, one called data and one called uh, IDX. And uh, uh, with the, with the um, SQL statements on the right side, we can create, for example, a table and say this table needs to be in the table space uh, data. And we can also create indexes or constraints in general through the using index table space uh, um, statement. So all of these really, if you have large databases, can, can, can oh, sorry, the same technique, we will see it in larger databases, but for simpler databases, this is already um, performance improvement. So let's try uh, with a very simple example. I probably you have uh, all uh, dealt with uh, 
uh, web access logs. And uh, this is an example of access log. I will use the timestamp as uh, you know, our, our um, uh, most important uh, uh, um, dimension here. And this, is, this isn't just theory. This is actually something that we might call like Jonathan Gonzalez we've done in the past and uh, he's a fluent bit uh, maintainer as well and we, we actually uh, use fluent bit to parse and store the, this, this table in Postgres. So uh, as time passes, the fact table that I showed before uh, expands, it accumulates every, uh, every month new data. And so think about, think about how frequently you access um, old or versus new data. Uh, so think about this access pattern. Is newer data typically accessed more often? But these are kind of questions we, we need to ask yourselves. Also consider the scenario where the Postgres planner decides that uh, to retrieve a specific month, so it's actually faster to do a sequential scan, a sequential full table scan. And uh, uh, also, what happens every time you update or delete uh, um, a record, what happens to the, to the index? You are sharing the same index with all the records of, of the table. Or when you need to remove an entire month. So this is pretty, mu pretty much the main cause of bloat uh, of your Postgres database when you remove uh, a lot of data like that. So the database over time becomes less and less efficient, so it, this cannot scale. So the solution uh, to this common problem is uh, known in the database um, industry as horizontal table partitioning. So uh, this is very common in data warehousing. I come from the data warehousing world and in general, very large database environments. Essentially, this technique uh, um, involves slicing uh, table records horizontally and spreading them across different tables. These tables are known as partitions. So basically what we do is we create this kind of abstract table called uh, uh, partition table, from which we derive the, the, the concrete tables that are the, the partitions. So basically each month resides in its own table and uh, with, it, with its own indexes. So over time these tables become pretty much uh, uh, read-only and uh, maybe they're uh, less frequently accessed. So the, the indexes don't need any more updates. So the cool thing is that uh, partitioning can also be combi combined with table spaces, allowing all the data to be moved to, to, to cheaper storage. So essentially, uh, the, the partition, uh, partitions uh, are kind of a first level index so that uh, the routing of, of, of inserts and queries is more, more efficient. And uh, um, retrieving, for example, the data of a whole month is much faster than, than before. Uh, if you want to remove a whole, a whole month of data, you simply drop, drop the table. So you don't have to update any more indexes. Uh, the cool thing is that out of the box, Postgres open source comes with all this stuff and that um, you can actually achieve uh, partitioning by range, list, hash, and also have sub-partitioning. Anyway, declarative uh, partitioning is a complex topic. You can study more by yourself. I'll give you an example here on how to partition by range using the timestamp. This is a partition table, and this is how you create partitions. This is all through SQL. And this is how you can, for example, put the current data in uh, uh, fast uh, table space, fast volume, and progressively move all data in cheaper storage and, and, uh, and basically achieve uh, optimization of cost and, and performance. This is how you can set the table space, by the way, as I've shown before. Don't worry, you can alter uh, the table at a later time and move the, the data in, in another uh, uh, table space. Now the cool stuff. Yeah, so this is pretty cool. The uh, maybe you want. Uh, so you know, we mentioned that. Uh, well, Gabrielle mentioned that uh, we really have to, you know, think about benchmarking things for you know your specific workloads and things like that. Um, 
before we start talking about obviously doing these repeatable benchmark text tests, I'll just go back and highlight. And again, I said, I mean, I love Kubernetes, so I always will throw, throw the value back in there. Um, I think it's super simple, is my, my technical term, to iterate on this stuff, right? Because as we showed, to change how you configure things, it's simply simple stanzas or fields, right, within, the, within, your, um, within your CRD. Right, so if you want to try, if I want to do a right, am I going to have put the wall separately? Right, am I going to do table spaces? Right, you can continue to iterate on this stuff, and especially in cloud and en cloud environments, uh, it's much easier. Right, you don't have to worry about where that storage is mounted. So it makes it very easy to iteratively test and try out these different scenarios. So obviously, you know the key things here: start small, right? Uh, start with kind of a single instance of a cluster, uh, which makes sense, right? Um, this is pretty cool. There's a tool, PG Bench. Uh, I think the link down there talks more about running this yourself and how to use this yeah. tool. Uh, but this makes it easy to re reproduce even the results that we'll show in the next one. Um, the other key thing in your testing, so that you don't skew your results, uh, recommendation was uh, 4x the size of memory so that you're actually forcing, you're checking your actual disk performance and not checking your memory and caching performance. Um, and the beauty of this is with this link down below, again, to rerun this, anybody can run, set up and run your tests on a Kubernetes environment, your own, anywhere in the cloud. Uh, so on the next slide, I think we'll talk about the uh, simple base specifications here. We're going small. Um, note, you know, these aren't the, uh, this is nothing small. I just wanted to call that out. I know Gabriel will get mad yeah, at me. 1.5 Yeah, yeah, you Postgres know. Postgres is nothing. Yeah, but. yeah. I mean, Postgres can do whatever it needs to do. Um, we're going to do a PG, uh, this bench OLTP processing here. Um, again, here is the sort of size, right? I won't read it all out, but, you know, 4,500, 66 gigs. I'll do 16 clients uh, and a simple sort of sort of round tripping. Uh, and then on the next one, I think we talk about what were the scenarios that we tested. So we wanted to try out a few of the various like techniques that are in there. Do we just do a single volume? What's our sort of performance look like that? Probably call that your baseline. Do we dedicate a volume for the write ahead logs? Do we look at table spaces for data? And then do we do even do uh, for the for the indexes? Sorry. And then do we actually do the the last one that was shown, which was sort of uh, partition the data and have table spaces there? The results are um, pretty interesting in this particular case. Um, maybe they're not as you know surprising. Obviously, um, scenario two, which you can see sort of highlighted, um, worked well in three you know I guess three scenarios really. Um, sort of a bare metal scenario. Uh, there were two on uh, on Google. Um, and that's just because we have, you know, between us and Amazon and other ones, everybody has different storage and different storage classes and different backing. Scenario two, as you remember, was separating the write-ahead log out, which typically would make sense, right? But the performance is pretty significant, right? And then as a small thing, we even ran two tests in Google, um, which was using just standard PD or SSD. Uh, and maybe the difference here on SSD and PD at this scale wasn't like significant enough that maybe you'll decide, hey, it's good enough for me and I'm not gonna pay the extra cost. Um, but still a pretty good news. Yeah. And we also have to remember that we're just using 1.5 cores. Okay, so this is really, so if you, if you scale with yeah. the CPU, results could be, uh, could be yeah. better, well, you know? But yeah. Yeah, we're not going to have parallel writes to disk and things like that, right? If you're, you're still, used, you're still sh contact sharing the same CPU. But then the other interesting result was that it turns out that in the EKS case, for example, uh, scenario three was actually better. Right, in terms of it's improving it. Oh, that was the biggest improvement for it. So I guess the, the TLDR is, you know, kind of test in your environment and where you are, right? But again, it's fairly simple. We just use the same tests here to run this, you know, on these same clusters, spin them up in these environments, take your configs, deploy it, uh, and, and you're ready to yeah. go. There's people that have done also tests on Raspberry Pis and, you know, 250 transactions per se. <laughs> I like that. Um, the key outcome here, I kind of, I, I always get ahead of myself, um, but that's, that's fine. Um, in this particular case, uh, PG data and the Walt right ahead logs, you can see the improvements that we saw, uh, also depending on which sort of disk type we used. Um, again, we, uh, Gabriella highlighted that this is only 1.5 core, so it's kind of, uh, maybe won't test as much if we, if we were separating out and partitioning by table spaces, but there was still improvement over the baseline, it's just that it wasn't as insignificant as the improvement as wall was in this particular case. Um, and again, storage capabilities are important, right? Um, but I'll just leave it with, it's really nice to be able to just run these tests kind of quickly, right? It doesn't take much to set this up. Kubernetes cluster is up and running. 
You can pick your default storage classes, you can specify your storage classes, and then you can specify how you want to divide things up. Pass it over yeah, to and I want to thank people. So the good story about this is that from now we can actually, uh, everyone can test this stuff. And I want to say uh, the people here for uh, having helped me uh, produce this, this benchmark. And as I was saying, we're just uh, scraping the surface now. So this is uh, a non-export territory for everyone. This is just, for example, a slide that Sajgi uh, from Lightbits did using uh, TCP, uh, NVMe over TCP. And uh, this is just basic performance, okay? This, this is just a starting point. We're talking about 15,000 transactions per second okay, to start with, okay? Um, so conclusions, um, we cover this for, um, for primary uh, sections. And uh, so lesson learned today is that storage, I hope you understand, it's the, is probably the most critical part for a database in vertical scalability. But do your benchmarks, know your goals. So know your goals in terms of RTO, RPO. Don't forget that you have to back up and restore and you have to ensure high availability. So all of this is included in this. Okay, so uh, Postgres, I hope you saw today, can scale up uh, through volumes. My recommendation is to use shared nothing architectures. So maybe consider uh, placing Postgres in nodes separated from applications, but running in the same Kubernetes clusters. And uh, there's no one size fits all, but that's also the good part that it's on you, the work is on you, because again, your organization is unique. So all, all you, have, you, you have an amazing set of technologies, in my opinion. You've got Kubernetes, you've got Postgres, and I, I like to say you've got also Cloud Native PG now. And uh, you can, you're free to run it everywhere. You know, uh, private, public, hybrid, multi-cloud, bare metal, VMs, and uh, using local or network disks. So uh, last thing, join. Uh, our data on Kubernetes community, if you want to know more about stateful workloads and also the, the cloud native PG uh, community. So, thank you. And questions? questions? Are there any questions? I think they learned everything they needed to know today, so. And it's six o'clock. Hello, I have a Hi. question about uh, the backup and the fact that you split the data into several volumes. Yeah. If you do snapshot of disk, you don't have a coherent, uh, coherent uh, snapshot. Thank you for the question. Okay, so we, we are pretty much one of the first operators in the database space to support volume snapshot. Uh, backups and recovery. I, if you can go to the KubeCon in uh, Chicago, uh, so you can watch the video that, uh, of the talk that I gave with Michelle from Google. Uh, it's called Disaster Recovery about very, very large databases in Postgres. I showed how to uh, restore uh, a 4.5 terabyte database in two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, so the consistent is, is granted by the wall file. So essentially when you take, uh, when you start the backup procedure, uh, uh, you take a snapshot of all the volumes and we ensure that we copy also the, 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 the wall file at the start of the backup and at the end of the backup, okay? The other way is that we also have a, a, a way we call them called backups where you can actually uh, take a backup from a standby, we shut it down temporarily, and then you take a, a, basically a cold snapshot. So that's consistent by default, and we, we spin it up. So it's done automatically by the operator. Okay. What we're working on, and I would like Leonardo to stand up, please. Leonardo is actually working with tag storage to implement the first uh, operator supporting volume group snapshots in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is working on, on ensuring consistency of, of multiple volumes at the same time, and we are the first kind of pioneers 
of, of this technology. So we're really happy. It, it, actually, there's already a patch for that. So, but this is how it's achieved. So it's, it's con Postgres allows you to, 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 to um, basically uh, exploit all of that. You know, this is a technology that's been in Postgres for over almost 20 years. So it's very stable. Thank you for the question. No more questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody.